I'm not teaching at the moment. I used to teach in Mexico. Okay. Elvira. Elvira. Oh, we were in the middle, right? Yeah. yeah. Have to go back and then mm -hmm. but yeah. Okay. Uh, Ayala. אין בעיה, רק אני לא רוצה שיהיה להם את הדבר הזה בכחול הזה. רגע, אבל לסגור את זה פה, כן? סליחה, אני רוצה לסגור פה, got it. כן? טוב, אוקיי, אני פשוט סבבה. נאווה, ילד, אלווירה, ואלי. And you are working. I'm not currently in that station, but I'm still working on professional. So we'll see. Maybe I should get some more on short. Okay. Hi, the learners, right? Yes. Good morning. Hi. Nice to see you. Okay, so just getting to a little bit, getting to know everyone. Um, remind me your, your first names, Rabbi and Rabbi. Yosef, so we're um, um, the classes. I guess not just today are dedicated in memory of uh, of Moshe Ben Rabbi Malka and Rabbi Aryeh Bina. Um, Mamash. Um, okay, I want to. I'm going to introduce myself, and we're doing this this combination of Zoom and live. And I want to say that as a teacher, I feel I feel very torn about it because I teaching on Zoom and teaching in person are two very different mediums as a teacher. And so I'm going to try and uh, I, I'm gonna. I have a PowerPoint because also for teaching poetry in particular, I think that it's extremely helpful. But it's also because I want to try and give everybody on Zoom something that's also concrete. Last year when I was teaching on Zoom, I only you know I use PowerPoint always. Um, but I also think it'll be helpful for us here. I, I want that to go away. Hold on. Where's the Where's the mouse? Shomim oti. Atam yicholim lechabot et et halon katan. We're literally on three computers at the same time. Um, so I do want to say that, especially to everybody who's listening on Zoom, that I am thinking about you, and I am going to try and and try and work both of the of the mediums together. Um, another piece, which is that I know that often. Uh, particularly for those on Zoom, having questions can be difficult and disruptive because you can't hear what's going on. So, but it's important for me with all of you in the classroom, you can all ask questions. I will repeat the question so that the people on Zoom can hear it better than how they can hear it in the classroom. So just know that I'll be parroting you. Um, and uh, again, I, I'm torn about, about the whole hybrid thing because I feel as a teacher, it, it's, it's two different forms of pedagogy. Um, Okay, so a little bit about me, because uh, I don't know a number of you. Uh, my name is Yosefa. I've been, I was a student in my time many years ago. I've been teaching here for a long time. It's also sad for me that I'm not allowed to move because <laughs> or else I can't see me. It's also, I'm a very over on the classroom lady, but I'm going to try and stay put. Um, I currently uh, am a Rami de Miguel Oz, where I get to hang out with, uh, with, uh, with Shayna. Uh, and I work in Miguel Oz, I'm there for, uh, for the Benot Achrei Shirut, um, which is just a lovely, lovely place to be. And I'm here in Matan, and please God, I also host a podcast. Um, anyone missed last year's episodes, you're welcome to go on Spotify, Google Play, any of the, any of the main feeds and look up Matan and you'll see below the Parsha um, podcast we put out in the summer, two seasons of uh, of um, 
of, I think, really great content. The first season was basically me speaking with teachers uh, and mostly teachers in Matan and their journey into the Torah world. And then we did another season of women writing. And so every episode was meeting with another woman who uh, who was writing a different book in the Torah world. And we're in the process of recording another, another few series. They're doing a series with Tanya White on um, the light subject of suffering and evil. Um, and but really having conversations about sort of theologies that have been marginalized over the years that we think could be really helpful and relevant for people struggling with with just general difficulty in life. And then another another series with uh, with Dr. L. Ziegler, our new um, our new head of Matan, about character development in Tanakh. So I'm going to be doing sort of like four part series that are more content based. Last year was more sort of conversation, and that's the kind of direction we're going in now. So check us out on uh, all podcast feeds. Okay, I'm done with my self-promotion. On, uh, on to this year's topic. So the first semester I've chosen to teach a uh, first semester of biblical poetry. Uh, semester here is about 14 classes. Uh, second semester I'm doing uh, Yirmiyahu Nechizkel, sort of a taste of Chorban, something totally different. Uh, and what I want to say is that today's class is an introductory class, and I, I want to be very unacademic and say it's going to be a little bit dry and technical, but it's an important base, okay? I don't want to use the word boring, but it's an important base, and I've thought about this, but it's we need those tools to be able to move forward and learn biblical poetry. We're going to focus on Shira Shirim and Sefer Tihilim, which are two very different kinds of poetry also. We're going to start with Shira Shirim, and then we're going to move into, into a number of classes on Sefer Tihilim which will also require its own introduction of what is Tehillim, who wrote Tehillim, where does that even come from? But we'll get there uh, when we get there. So um, let's talk about biblical poetry. And again, please feel free to ask questions. You don't have to be silent. I, I don't like to lecture and just hear myself. Um, did it move? Yes. Um, how do we know when we're looking at a poetic text in Tanakh? It sounds like a simple question. It's not a simple question. And the answers are even are even more complex. How do we know that that's what we're looking at? Hold on, this is not my computer, so I just need to see it. How, okay, great. Um, and I do wanna say that for today's class, I've really um, utilized two books, two main books. Um, one is The Art of Biblical Poetry by Robert Alter, which if anyone's been more familiar with the art of biblical narrative, uh, which is a little bit more enjoyable read, but um, the art of biblical poetry is an excellent book. And and James Kugel is a really old versions. Uh, the idea of biblical poetry also is really fundamental. Um, it's as I was re I I mean I, Robert Alter is these are sort of like two you know cornerstone uh, Bible academics um, from the states. And uh, James Kugel's book, I every time I read him, I'm sort of like astounded anew at how, what of an unbelievable scholar he is. I mean, the breadth of his research is really, Robert Alter is really a, liter, a literature guy, and that's what comes through, and those are the sources he reads, and James Kugel, he, some of us may be familiar with the How to Read the Bible, maybe that was one of them that like, made a little bit more a broad impact, but his main research that he spent decades researching was really um, Second Temple, Targum, all the earliest reception of Tanakh and how all the earliest commentators perceived Tanakh and, and dealt with it and dealt with all the different issues. And he's so steeped in that world and, and that, that scholarship really comes through. Hold on. Okay. So as soon as we perceive this is from someone else, but it was in those books. As soon as we perceive that a verbal sequence has a sustained rhythm, uh, that it is formally structured. Okay. Um, this shiur is dedicated. Uh, she took many classes at Matan uh, for many years and enjoyed them. And today is her 10th year site. Wow. Okay. Um, this is like a Yortzeit week. My in-laws both have Yortzeit. I have the Yortzeit in Motzei Shabbat for my father. It's like a very, very amus, a very amus week. Um, I'll start again. As soon as we perceive that a verbal sequence has a sustained rhythm, that it is formally structured according to a continuously operating principle of organization, we know that we are in the presence of poetry and we respond to it accordingly. Now that sounds like a lot of big words, but what it means also is that when we read a text and all of a sudden we're sort of struck 
by its structure, which doesn't happen if you're just reading a regular paragraph. It's not, it's not the feeling you get as a reader. You read a, a prose paragraph, it's, you sort of flow into it. It's kind of like a river a little bit. You sort of flow in and flow out depending on the content. But when you read poetry, you're immediately struck that there's something very formal about it. There's something structurized. Okay, so that's, that's one way to, to talk about it. But now I wanna break that down. Um, so there is a, the main feature of what we might call poetry, and we're gonna challenge this, is what's something called parallelism. Okay, parallelism is when you have the pasuk, and we're gonna see examples of all this, we're not gonna leave it as theory, and you break it into parts, usually into two clauses, or what we call versets, or three. Um, and I would say the vast majority of readers of Tanakh, including the most, the earliest rabbinic commentaries, including also scholarship today, all agree that parallelism exists. I mean, nobody really argues that. But on one end of that spectrum, you do have, and everybody has to contend with him, you have James Kugel, the book that I brought here, um, where he basically says that there is no real parallelism or poetry in Tanakh. All verses are on a, uh, on a continuum of prose with poetic elements, okay? And that is what most of us assume to be a very extreme view. Meaning most say, well, of course, Tehillim is some sort of poetry. Of course, Eo, for example, is some sort of poetry. We'll have to talk about, but what about Sukim that are put in here and there throughout narratives? Are those considered poetry or are they parts of the narrative that have poetic elements? Uh, and these things, they might sound very technical, but they actually have a very big ramifications as to how you understand them within the context of the text. And so on one end of the spectrum, you have you have James Pugel, and he says, it's not really poetry, any of these verses. And again, we'll see what we mean in a moment. It's just that B adds something different or, or, uh, or wants to contrast with the first part of the sentence, or um, A and B are related as subordination. I'll explain in a minute, when, if, or just as, or B reasserts A, which is another way of saying that B is basically similar to the first part. It just says it in another way, okay? So let's, let's, um, What's the other side of that argument? It is rare to find anywhere a poetic style that does not bear some relation to the literary prose of the same culture. Or rather, it turns out in many instances that literary prose is influenced by contemporary or antecedent poetry in the same language, often seeking knowingly or unwittingly to achieve for itself a quasi-poetic status without the formal constraints of verse. And here he says something different. He says, no, I don't agree with you at all, James Colville. Of course there's poetry. He said, but of course there's going to be a relationship between poetic texts of a certain culture and the written text, the prose text of that culture, right? If I am starting to write a poem, which I don't because I hate writing poetry, but I love writing prose, if I'm starting to write a poem, of course I'm going to be using similar words and similar metaphors and similar structures, but I'm going to change it in, 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 to fit in with how I perceive poetry to be. And so he says that of course it's going to be a relationship with them, but that's not the same as saying that there's no such thing as poetry at all. He says, of course there's going to be poetry. Um, and, he, and he says also that, um, this is interesting because I don't like poetry because I always find that it's very limiting, right? I like prose because I feel like I can just spread out all over the page. But they looked at poetry and we'll see also very, very differently. They looked at it the opposite, that, that that prose had more rules about it and that poetry had within it more of a fluidity, more of an artistic element. It was a different perception of, of those different forms of writing. Okay, we're gonna look at some examples. Here's a non-biblical example for a moment. First, so that we all just understand what is parallelism and why am I talking about it so much, okay? Taking a very basic example from Arts Philoth every day. We have Elena Le Chabert. Okay, if you look at it, and we're gonna see, I have everything in fancy colors coming along. Elena Le Chabert, I don't know, I want to be able to write on this, but I see they pull down the screen, I can't write on it. Um, if I look at the second sentence, that we weren't put, we weren't created like the uh, nations of the rest of the world. And we weren't placed here like families of the earth. Do we all see that these first half and the second half are basically saying the same thing? We have shelo velo, asanu samanu, kegoye haratzot kemishpachot Okay. I, I'm going to have to ask, ask them after I can pull this up because I want to circle things on it. 
but these are parallel to each other. Okay, it's what we'll call in a minute semantic parallelism. It's the same ideas in different words in the same exact order. Okay. Um, I'm just going to keep looking. That our, our lot wasn't made like them, and our and our goal, our faith also is not like the rest of them. Again, the same thing stated in two different ways. The word shelo, by the way, is here and needs to be carried over here. And that's called ellipses. When you don't use a word, but you're supposed to imply that it should be there. We left it out, but we're supposed to assume it's in the second half. Um, and they continue. They daven to empty gods, and they also daven to uh, a god that will not save them. Okay, and it continues and continues. All these alenu, which we don't even think about it because it's in a plump paragraph in the end of tefillah. If you break it down, has all of its verses are have parallelism, where the first part has some relationship to the second one, whether it says the same thing, whether it says something opposing. Now my question becomes, is this poetry? Right? Our very technical question, I think, is a little bit clearer now. When I read it in the Sidur, it's in a paragraph form, because that's the way it's printed, and I don't think about it as a poetic text. But then I put it on the board like this, and we see that it has a complete structure to it. So is this poetry or is it not poetry? And again, you might say, why does it matter, Yosefa? It matters very much, because am I supposed to look at these sentences that sound like they say the first, the same thing in the beginning, the second thing in the second half, and compare them? Am I supposed to think that maybe Heva Barik and Elo Yoshia, am I supposed to try and figure out what's different about those phrases? Is one of them supposed to deepen the meaning? It, it, it changes the questions we ask. And so what do I, what do you think about this? I mean, do you think of this as a poetic text when you read it? We don't, but it is. And so Abby, you're saying that, well, because there's parallelism, I guess it should be poetry. So James Kugel would say, this is not poetry. He would say, this is the way that, again, this is not a biblical text. I purposely didn't start the biblical text right now. But if this was a biblical text, he would say, it's just the way that Tanakh writes, meaning it's all over the place. And we'll see in a minute a totally parallel verse in a very, you know, very basic narrative of ours. He would say, it's not poetry. It's just the way that 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 Tanakh writes and even more so so that when much later rabbinic text this is from who oh, I should remember which century I want to say the eighth century but I think that that's too early I have to I have it written down um but uh it's def it's it's very very early I think well because we have a Masora that Reva wrote Elenu Le Shabach Sorry, this version of it was taken from an 8th century Sidur, but we have Alina Shabech is already in, is from the time, is from, uh, is from the time of the, uh, of the Amoraim. Um, but this itself was, I remember in the book I was reading, this version itself was taken from an 8th century Sidur. So, um, so what do we, what do we do with this? Okay, what do we do with these texts? Or do they become po poetry because they have parallelism or is parallelism just a feature of, of all texts? And so as I, as we see much later on, people, rabbis who were writing texts imitated the style of Tanakh. I mean, they wanted to write in the same style, so they wrote in this, in this way with parallelism as well. Okay, now let's, let's get to the more essential question of why use parallelism. We're gonna swing back to this question about poetry. Okay, it's sort of a general hovering question. Why use parallelism at all? Uh, I think there are four, uh, four possibly good reasons. Um, okay, so we're leaving that question hovering. Is that poetry? Why does it matter? Okay, now we're gonna to go to parallelism, which is one of our main features, but we're gonna talk about others, like meter uh, and, and others as well. Parallelism gives a satisfying feeling of emphasis in stating the same thing twice with variation, okay? I will say that someone very kindly gave me a lot of positive feedback about earlier podcast episodes. And one of the things she told me was, but I want you to know, I'm saying this in a you know constructively critical way, that you tend to say the same thing twice in a row. And I, and I, Really appreciated it. I know that it's true. As a teacher, when you see yourself getting up in front of a crowd, so you, you're, you, you're self-conscious in, in an important way. And everybody, some people have ums, some people have spaces in their speech. 
And some people, in order to buy time, their brain will catch up what they're saying, say the same thing twice in two different ways. So I'm definitely one of those people. But it was so funny that she said it, and I was, and I was thinking about parallelism also, because that is a way of creating speech also. For me, it also creates a, a holistic feeling to my speech. When I write, I always write in threes and I notice it. And I also try and make sure that it doesn't, it doesn't dominate too much, but I, I love the three structure of done, done, and done. And I, it comes out all the time. So when I speak, apparently I speak in parallelism when I write, I write in, I don't know that what it's called in, in poetic terms. So, but there is a, there is a feeling of emphasis and a certain satisfaction that you get when something is said twice in two slightly different ways creates unity to the text. That's why I always go for that three structure in writing because it does give like a sense of completeness uh, and a unity. Memorability. And this one's really important because we always have to remember that especially biblical texts and especially poetic texts, they were initially all spoken, right? Whenever we read a text and I, and I utilize literary methods of study all the time, but I utilize it with a consciousness and with an awareness that these texts were most of them were first spoken. And especially poetic texts, I will say that I'm not going to get into questions of authorship, and I will speak in a moment about the human aspect of everything we're saying and how that fits into the, a traditional worldview. But in a biblical, a biblical poetry are thought to be some of the earliest, from the earliest texts, meaning when we have Yaakov's, uh, Yaakov's brachot to his children, and it's written in poetic ways, those are thought to be also statements that went around, meaning it was Yaakov saying them to his children, but they were also statements that either before that or after that sort of circled around. He was using sort of stock ideas that he then brings into his brachot. And so these are ideas that were spoken, that, that I don't think is something that's so far reaching. And so when you have parallelism, it makes it much easier to remember, okay? It's, we, we think about that concept all the time, also in Talmudic literature, that these are things that were spoken and people had to remember them often by heart. And so that it's helpful to remember. And the fourth, which I think is also really important, and this we can understand, anyone who writes for in particular, that it contributes to a sense that this is an elevated kind of discourse, right? That, and we'll get to this at the end when we speak about poetry and prophecy. But when you wanna convey that you are engaging in something that is divine, that is beyond the regular, it needs to be presented in a different kind of way, right? If we just, if we just write something that's mundane, it doesn't, it doesn't give off any of the, any of the spirit, I think. It doesn't, it doesn't enable us to connect with the spirit of what we're, what we're reading. And so parallelism is a way, again, these are all suggestions, none of this is a hard science, but parallelism is a way to reflect the divinity and the depth and the, the, the infinite nature of, of the kind of text that we're meeting. Okay, questions? Okay. Hold on, okay, here's our example. Um, so I wanna bring another quote from our altered and then I wanna balance it out with some, with some chazal. Um, now, I will say that it's important. Robert Alter is writing completely looking at Tanakh as, as a work of literature, as written by humans. That's not, he is not coming at it with a, with a uh, traditional perspective at all. Uh, and that comes through in this, in this statement. Literature, let me suggest, from the simplest folktale to the most sophisticated poetry and fiction and drama, thrives on parallelism, both stylistic and structural, on small scale and large, and could not give its creation satisfying shape without it. But it is equally important to recognize the literary expression abhors complete parallelism, just as language resists true synonymity. Synonymity, usage always introducing small. There's a typo there. Usage always introducing small wedges of difference between closely akin terms. Um, so he speaks about the importance of parallelism. We've spoken about that until now, but what he says is that even if two parts of the sentence sound almost exactly the same, and I'll even say that some of the phrases in Alain Shabach sound really, really, really similar. He says that they're never going to be completely synonymous because the second you use a different word for the same thing, it has a different thrust to it. It has a different feel. It has a different, um, has a different sense, a different, he would say, a different, um, a different um, sort of, it comes with different associations. And so the second, he says, no two sentences are ever really the same. Even if they're the closest possible parallelism out there, they're always gonna have some difference. So let's see different approaches in traditional. Yes, please, remind me your name, Bill. Minda. Minda. Um, this is, uh, 
I got stuck. Yeah. You didn't what what is stylistic? <laughs> yeah. I, like structural, I understand. But structural means like structural when you have understand. parts of let's say a narrative where they're going to be parallel to each yeah. other okay and stylistic is what we've seen until now it's in the in the actual sentence that you have it broken up into parts you have oh, we'll see in a second really like exactly okay. what stylistic means and we'll divide into different kinds okay, okay? but structural means the, the let's say when you can take a narrative and divide it in half and they're parallel to each other okay it's the structure and how it's created and stylistic will be in the nuance of words that are parallel to each other or the sounds are parallel to each other. They're much smaller units of parallelism. Okay, we'll see. In, we'll see an example. Okay, so where do we go? What, what is Chazal? What, what do they have to say about parallelism? Okay, how did they interpret all of these sukim all throughout uh, Torah and Nevi'im and Ketuvim? It's not as clear as I had hoped, right? You can't see this well, right? One second. Let me see. Can I turn off the light? Is that? That one better? Okay, I'll know next time not to use the blue. Um, okay, here's a pasuk from Sefer Dvarim. Okay, Paragdamadim, let's see if they yell me for turning off the lights. Um, from Sefer Dvarim. Yorum Mishpatecha Liyakov. This is not in the pasuk. I added it, okay? Ve Toratcha Liyisrael. Now, if we look at the pasuk, I've highlighted the parts for a very clear reason. You will, your mishpatim will be taught to Yaakov, meaning the descendants of Yaakov, and your Torah to Yisrael. Now I've added the word Yoru because this is another case of what I call, I know that it, there's a reason why I didn't put it on, on, on full form. I understand that it's a little bit weird. We're going to have to figure out the details of the technicalities for next week. Um, it's for the purpose of the Zoom. So this is in here. You have to understand that Yoru needs to be, right? It's called an ellipses. It's, it's not there, but it needs to be added to the second half. Uh, it's all over, all over, all over. And sometimes it's in the verb, sometimes it's in the noun. You have to figure out which one is missing. It's a stylistic aspect. And here, Yoru Mishpatecha is clearly parallel to Toratcha, and Yaakov is parallel to Israel. We all see that? We're good? Okay. Now, I brought here, it's in English, of the Sifrei, okay? The, the Midrash Halacha and Sefer Dvarim. And the Midrash says, your teaching indicates that there are two laws, the oral and the written. Okay, your teaching, meaning Torah Now, how does the Midrash understand this Pasuk? It completely and utterly recognizes that the Pasuk says the same thing in two different ways. But what it does with it instead is say, well, if it says Mishpatecha and then says Torah it's coming to teach you Torah Shabichtav and Torah Shabalpeh. Meaning it's not the same thing said in two different ways. It's not just a nice way of talking, but it's coming to hint to Torah Shebichtav and Torah Shebalpeh. So it utterly recognizes parallelism, but says that it has direct meaning and import for how we understand the verse. Another example. And here I took a, a verse from a narrative context, from Akidat Yitzchak, okay? Not from, from a poetic text in Sefer Dvarim or elsewhere. From Bereshit Kaf Bet, okay, Pasuk Bet, Al Tishlach Yadcha El Hanar, Ve'al Ta'as Lo Meuma. Okay, don't, from the end of Akedat, the middle of Akedat Yitzchak, don't throw your hand at the, at the young boy, Ve'al Ta'as Lo Meuma, and don't do anything, don't, don't hurt him, okay? And here I've highlighted, Al Tishlach Yadcha Al Ta'as Meuma, Okay, it's not semantic parallelism. It's not exactly the same order, but all the elements are parallel to each other. Um, okay, how does the Midrash understand this pasuk? Here it says it's a conversation between the Malach and Abraham. Right, someone else might remember this Midrash, but he was so he was so impassioned. He was so ready to do akedat Yitzchak. He was so ready to sacrifice his son. He said, "Well, uh, let me let me just at least get you know be matiz dam. Let me get a little bit of, of blood from him so that I can you know be masamen I could check off the fact that I, I really was ready to do the akedat. So let me just a little bit of blood. Okay, it's obviously a very a very weird conversation. Um, the the malach says to him, "Al to ask al to ask lo meuma, al to ask lo muma." Okay, and, and, the, and the Malach says, 
What does it mean, Ant Aslamuma? It doesn't just mean the same thing as Ant Shlachet Chalanel. It means it reads Meuma as Muma, like a moon, meaning don't maim him. It's not the same as don't do it. The first part of the sentence means don't do it, don't do the Akedah. And the second one says, because yeah, I, Avraham was so impassioned to do it, he says, don't even maim him, don't even hurt him a little bit. And so the Midrash, again, recognizes that this is these are two parallel parts of the verse but it reads other meaning into the second half it doesn't just say yeah it's it's the same thing it's a poetic expression of how the malach was speaking to avram which is would be a more you know a slightly more academic literary way of responding to it the midrash says no no no. this is adding something new it's also telling us that he wanted to maim him and the malach has to tell him don't even do that to him okay so there's a recognition of parallelism, but it's not something that's particularly cared about for a stylistic perspective. And here, so we have a little bit of a summary. This is a really good word to know. It's one of my favorites. Omnisignificance is the word for that every word in the Torah has meaning. Okay, that's that word. It's a great word to know. Um, so omnisignificance, that is an operating principle for most of Chazal, that every word means something and is there for a reason, right? We're familiar with maybe Rabbi Kiva, he was Doresh even every et, right? Every every uh, indirect article. And so some of us may still operate with those, may operate with those principles on a regular basis. We may read the Torah and and always assume that. It's a it's a classic rabbinic position. Why am I saying it like that? Because you have many Rishonim who didn't take that position later on. You have many Rishonim who are more influenced by, by Arabic poetry, uh, Ibn Ezra, Moshe Ibn Ezra, um, and, and many others as well, who at uh, Radak, later also in France, who look at it and say, no, it's not necessarily, right? Kefal Lashon is a phrase you might be familiar with. It's the same thing said in two different ways, but that's not the mainstream uh, traditional rabbinic position. The, the, the traditional position is that every word has meaning. The, the nuance I do want to give is the machot between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael, which is a Rabbi Akiva be'emet was doresh every, right? Every keter, every, every ot in the Torah. Whereas Rabbi Ishmael says, I have it later on as well in, a, in, a, in the PowerPoint. That Torah right? It, it, you don't have to always explain every word in the Torah as having you know, a world mind-blowing significance. There's also a certain style. And so, and it's a very helpful principle because there are many places in the Torah where we are very we're very pressed to come up with deep meaning for every every part of every single word. And so that's already what I want to say. It's a machloket already within the Tanayim themselves of, do I really need to be dolish every single word? Or can I also say, there's a certain stylistic element to the Torah. And that's Rabbi Ishmael. That's, uh, I believe, Rabbi Brandis has a really good article about this in uh, in, in his book on Agadita. I have to remember after to look up. But so that's an important piece. So what the Midrashim we saw just now, they go more according to, I would say, more of a Kiva perspective of, it's not just there, it's not just repeating the same idea twice, it's there to tell you something different, to add something different to, to the text. Um, of course, I'll also say that, very unlike some of the quotes I was bringing you before from you know Bible academics who are not particularly interested in the divine authorship of the Torah, so they're gonna come at it very, very differently, um, that, you know, going too deep into parallelism and, and details is not going to be of, of huge interest to Chazal, who are clearly assuming divine authorship in, in all of the Torah texts. I'm not going to talk about Navi right now, but certain all of the Torah texts. Um, and they notice the parallelism, and even, they even write using it. They have many of their own texts themselves. They write in parallelism. Um, but the whole point is to mine for meaning. And just noting parallelism isn't particularly meaningful, which is something that we're discovering right now as we go through class. So um, they want to find the meaning in it. Okay, so what we've come up with so far is that I, I couldn't figure out on my computer how to put the X on that, uh, but I'm sure there's a function that just has the mm, mm, but I couldn't figure it out. So parallelism does not necessarily equal poetry, okay? I don't think that we would look at the pasuk of al tishlach yadcha el anar ve'al ta'as lo meuma and say that that's a poetic text. It utilizes parallelism, but it doesn't mean that that has turned the entire Akedah story into poetry. We're all on the same page so far? Okay. I really didn't meant to ask any questions. Okay. So what is poetry? Uh, and more significantly, for me also, what does the word shir mean in Tanakh? 
שיר השירים, משלי שלמה in ספר מלכים, ומשלים um, versus השירים that were thousands, what, what do those words mean in Tanakh? Does it mean something specific about how it was written? So I just, again, brought some ideas. There, there are so many out there. This is not a hard science. It's, it's sort of a, a it's, it's a liberal science. And so it, it's liberal. Um, so first of all, figurative, indirect, or hidden forms of expression. That would be something that would, um, that would reflect poetry. It is really, according to everybody, Tehillim, Mishle, and Iov are all poetic texts. Everything else is under a lot of scrutiny, OK? Um, those are three texts that are considered to be definitely poetic. Um, and we also know that, I mean, when we write prose, we speak much more directly to our reader. But when we write poetry, we sort of go about things in a roundabout way, right? We use a lot more figurative language. We sort of like hide more behind the words. Um, so that is also a parameter that we use in Tanakh as well. Um, song in Tanakh, and this is Rabbi Huda Levi's position. It's not everyone, it's Rabbi Huda Levi, he writes in the Kuzari. Um, song or shir in Tanakh means something sung. Okay, and here we get to the question that I didn't want to do a whole uh, PowerPoint on because I personally find it deathly boring, which is the topic of meter, okay, which is a very important topic, right? Meter is, you know, how many syllables, how, how is, you know, two, three, two, three, five. I just, I literally have no patience for it, so I wasn't going to pretend to teach it here. Um, but it's also a huge question. Are you supposed to be following meter? Does meter, does meter exist in Tanakh? It's very complicated. I, the short version is that it doesn't, it's not clear. It, there's nothing uniform. And so therefore everyone's been very hard stretched to figure out. It sounds silly, but when you talk about Shakespeare, Shakespeare has a very clear meter or a haiku, those Japanese poets, uh, poems, they have a very specific, you have right 14 lines, X number of syllables, you have to follow those rules. And so, so for years, scholars have tried to figure out, do we have those kind of rules in Tanakh? And they basically haven't been able to come up with any clear system. There's many suggestions, people have spent their entire life studying it. I just find it deathly boring. So I didn't bring it here. But, um, but what I will say is that um, Rabbi Huda Levi says that, that shir implies something that was sung, but it doesn't imply meter. Okay, which that to me is a very, very important idea. So Shira Shirim and this Chazal also later say, they must have been songs that were sung. Shira Shirim is also the most informal poetry, which is why I like it the best. It's not formal at all, okay? There's very few rules. It's, there's also narrative sort of tucked in there. And so that's why I love that. And we're gonna start with that because it's, it's not formal poetry, but Shira means something that was sung. And what does singing do, right? We all know this. Think about Zmirot on Shabbat. I'm trying to think of a good example. Anybody here ever sing Ka Echsof on Shabbat? Yes? Okay. So we all know that it does not fit right, at all. It's a huge mess. It's a huge mess, okay? But, right, and especially the last one, the last two lines, like it's a disaster, right? It does, nothing fits. But what happens when you sing a song, you can make things fit. I, and it's like every house comes up with their own way to make this mural fit to the, everyone, right? <laughs> it's a disaster. Now there's, there's clear poetry, a little bit less in that text, but in others, Mural Shabbat, they're, they're, they, were, they were composed as poems, but when we put them into a song, we make it fit. So even if, if the exact amount of syllables didn't match up, when we sing it, we sort of like, I think of like, you round it out. Like you round out a number, you round out the... So that's what Rabbi Yudha Levi says also is true about, about meter. He says, it doesn't matter the number of syllables or the consonants because these were texts that were originally sung. And so when people sang them, they made, they made it fit. And so it was poetry, but it didn't have like an exact system. But, but they made it fit because they, they, they fit it into the, into the tune. <coughs> Sorry. Meter was foregone for the sake of comprehension. The system of ta'amim, and this is a huge topic, which we'll just say one sentence about, was created so that everybody would read the same. One of these theories, and again, this is the Kuzari, but not only him, one of the theories where we have the ta'amim, which is how we largely read, which is how we should appropriately read at this point of hist in history, the ta'amim, says many, came in place of clear meter. When you didn't have ta'amim, it's a big, it's a big mess to figure out how to read. And there was no, there was no tamim. There's no, there's no vowels for centuries in the Torah, and there's certainly no nikud. And so every, it was a big free for all. Okay, the tamim was a system that was created so we would create a certain um, achidut. Help me out. A certain order. unity order. Thank you of unity of reading. And so, and so the tamim 
is what he says really comes, it doesn't, the meter doesn't matter. The timing, mean, by the way, follows the meaning of the words and not the poetic structure of them. We'll come up with, we'll come up against that a lot. Ta'amim follows the meaning of the word and not the poetic structure. So it'll break it in a spot that ruins the parallelism, but it might make more sense with the meaning. We'll see that as we look at the text themselves. Um, so we've spoken about meter in a very small amount, which is that meter exists, but it's unclear sometimes how exactly it needs to, be, it needs to work. And Rabbi Yehuda Levi says it doesn't really matter because these texts were sung anyways, and so people made it fit. Um, Melodies, I just read that, we said that. Okay, so what does it mean? Shil, shil means something that was, um, that was sung. Hold on, the computer is talking to me. Okay. Let's look at an example. Um, tov. We're not reading it like this, we want you to see it in whole. We're gonna look at the poem of Lemech in Sefer Breshit, okay? It was in, recently in the Parsha. Um, Lemech's poem, which we'll, I'll look at in big in a moment, comes at the end of the Cain's line, okay? Cain's line, we read this last week, two weeks ago, last week. No, Breshit. Um, so it comes at the end of Cain's line, um, okay, we keep going at the children and grandchildren and the future, and then we get to Lemech, okay? Um, where are we? And then they have their children. Um, we speak about also his brothers. And and we learn about that this basically, Cain's family was sort of like the birthplace of all creativity of the world. They created music, they created metallurgy, they created, uh, they created all different kinds of important tools um, that, that, um, that koach to kill and that, that energy that Cain has and that he puts into a very negative way, gets channeled into unbelievably creative enterprises in his children. That's the main in, in meaning uh, of the list that comes after. So let's look at the poem. Here it is without any of the parallelism highlighted, okay? Um, and I do wanna emphasize, again, it's important for me to say that every class is not going to be technical like this. I'm doing the technical because I want us to have a basis of words and of concepts, not gonna be like that. I also bring in a lot of modern Israeli music when we learn Shira Shirim, to see how Shirashim is used in modern, uh, in modern uh, Israeli parlance. They meant I want us to get some of the, the concepts uh, down so that we can use them in the future. Um, okay, here I just want us to see that it divides into two halves of meaning. Because I, um, I killed a man uh, and, and harmed him. And I harmed or I maimed a child. We'll talk about that. Because seven, uh, sevenfold will be avenged for Cain. But for Lemech, it will be 77 fold. Okay, what does that mean? We have no idea. Just want us to see the words for a moment. Okay. Um, so here I've broken one of the sukim down, the last pasuk. It's a weird song, okay? If anyone remembers, we usually like gloss over it. It's a very weird conversation. I will say that the first time man speaks to wife is this beautiful poetic verse, the first poetic verse, the Torah. Basali b'sali etzem is when when Adam declares he sees chava, and the first thing he has to say to this woman, his partner in life, is a verse of poetry. That's the first poetic verse in all of Torah. Uh, again, we have to add in all those questions we've said, what is poetry? How do I know what's poetic? So we, all those questions exist in, in the back of that statement. Um, and this is the next one we have, and it's a very different, it's a boasting, gloating, weird song that, you know, everybody's tried to understand what it means. No one really knows because it's very, very unclear where he's in some sense boasting to his wife about having killed or maimed somebody, the details of which we don't know. I will say that on a meaning level, what we see is that what goes around comes around, is that the line that started with Cain and with murder comes back with Lemech, okay? Many generations later, as much as we said that we have all the most creative 
uh, most creative initial generations are from the line of Cain. When you end the line of Cain with Lemech, you understand that his, his uh, propensity for violence doesn't leave the line either, and that it comes, it swings back with Lemech, okay? And that's why I believe of all the traditions that Torah could have told us about Cain's children and his prodigy and the line that comes after him, it tells you about Lemech and this very enigmatic song because, because it wants us to know that Cain's evil persisted and it doesn't just disappear. It doesn't just turn into positive creativity. The negativity of it also remains as well. Okay, so that's a word about, I think, the meaning of it. Um, so let's just talk about it for the, for about the technicalities. Um, ki shivatayim yukam kain ulemech. Okay, and here's what's it's contrasting. It's parallel, but they're contrasting with each other. Ki shivatayim yukam, and this is a paraphrase of the pasuk that comes earlier. In this is not here. This is a pasuk I brought from a few pasukim earlier. The punishment given to Cain, and then he complains to God, and God says, "Fine, I'll give you an oath." kol Cain you come. Anybody who tries to hurt Cain, he think he's very worried that he'll be he'll be vulnerable to the people around the world, that they will be avenged, and and they has he has a symbol on his head, his scarlet letter, so that nobody will um, will hurt him. And so Lemech paraphrases this sentence, which probably must have been something he was familiar with, right? It was his 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 ancestor. And he paraphrases it. Ki shiva time you come, Cain. If sevenfold anybody who hurts Cain will be avenged, then so too anybody who tries to hurt me. And I really think, I really think of Gaston, Beauty and the Beast. Anybody remember that? This he, this is Gaston. Okay, like that, like drinking the eggs and the and the coming into the pub, any uh, no, coming into the pub and and boasting to all there and trying to get the woman at the same time. So that is really the the thrust of this sentence. Um, and he says, and anybody who tries to hurt me after he clearly just hurt somebody else, this person, this child, unclear, shivatayim shivim v'shiva. The word yukam doesn't exist here. It's an ellipses, as we've explained already. And I put it in here for you to realize that you're supposed to add it, right? Ulemach yukam shivim v'shiva. Okay, and that's the same concept we saw before. Oh, uh, okay, let me show I have the same thing twice. Um, so another word about an idea there. Okay, so here we have this idea of if he will be avenged sevenfold, I'll be 77-fold. Okay, so that's another idea I want to see. It's going to come up, especially in Sefer Tehillim, of um, how much more so. You can call it that. Okay, the principle of how much more so. Here's another example from Sefer Dvarim. Another, uh, a few so came before the one we saw before of Torah uh, Chave. The echa yirdof echad elef doesn't the concept doesn't matter right now. I just want to see the idea. How could one pursue a thousand? Ushnaim yanisu revava and two put a myriad to flight. We have echad the shnaim elef the revava. Okay, and so we have this idea of we want to make an emphasis. We're gonna if we have numbers, we're gonna up the ante on the numbers. We're gonna talk about that. Sometimes we also up the ante on the verbs, make them more intense, make them more visceral. But the idea that we saw here of shiv of uh, of shiva taim and shivim v'shiva, we have it all over. Okay, this principle where in the second half of the sentence we're going to add more, we're going to make it more powerful. Okay. Okay. Um, this is Alter. I didn't write his name, but poets may sometimes choose to step up all the parallel terms in a line. Sometimes, less commonly. But in the majority of instances, it is rather one key set of match terms that carries the burden of development. Okay, and we're going to see that often with verbs. Okay, with the verbs, the verbs will become more intense, but not the rest of the sentence. So here's an example. Okay, here's another example of a question of how we deal with parallelism. Is it significant? Um, these are all a lot of fancy words. I'll read and explain it. A common noun, chico, okay, uh, a drunkard matched with an explanatory epithet or a metaphor in the second verse. Let's, let's read them and we'll understand. Hakitsu shikorim uvchu, rise drunkards and weep, vehelilu kol shoteyayin, and wail, meaning bemoan, all the drinkers of wine. Is it just the same thing? Or is shikor, it's not a very illustrative verb, it's a, it's a drunkard, okay? But 
Shote yain is already a much more descriptive, sorry, a noun. It's already a much more descriptive noun, right? It's, it's describing the act of what they do. A drunk versus those who drink wine, okay? It's, it's a more descriptive noun. Is it supposed to change the meaning in the second half of the verse? Right, we all see now there's, there's parallelism, right? Hakitsu hegilu shikurim v'shote yain, okay? Sorry, not bechu v'helilu and shikurim v'kol shote yain. It's parallel, but not in the same order. Unclear, unclear if it's supposed to be. We read it so we don't think about it. No one thinks about it, right? But I'm saying here we're going to take a minute and think about it. It's unclear if it really means anything different. Chigru v'sipdu ha'kohanim, helilu v'shartei mizbeach. Same parak later on. I'm ignoring the rest of the parallelism for a second. Kohanim and mishartei mizbeach. It, they're obviously we're both referring to Kohanim. Is Michel Temis Bach supposed to is supposed to emphasize their closeness to God? Are we supposed to read the second half of the Pasuk and say it has a meaning that's slightly different? Unclear. You can agree to you can all happily uh, disagree with me. Um, whereas this one, let's take another example. Ha'eten Becholi Pishi. Again, the context doesn't matter. Ha'eten Becholi Pishi Pri Vitni Khatat Nafshi. Shall I give I, my firstborn for my trespass, the fruit of my loins for my own sin? Now, here we're, we're speaking about the, the, the suffering that children will, will suffer. But are we supposed to understand the holy and privitni as privetan has with it? Does it have a different nuance? Does it have a different meaning to it? Some try and suggest yes. These are the questions that we have to ask ourselves, or is it just, is it just a parallel phrase? What is it just kefa lashon? There is something a bit more visceral, I think, about pribitni than about b'choli. B'choli is a more formal, it's a status, but pribetin is, is emphasizing the connection to that child. It's emphasizing the, the tragedy of if you, if you have to actually do something or separate from that, from that child. These are debates, and this is there's debates that come up all the time in Sefer Tzidi. Okay, some more tips for how to understand the parallels. Um, general terms, it, often, they're more general in the first verse, the first part, uh, and more specific in the second. You can't see them at all, can you? No. Um, I'll just read this one over here, that we have... His heart is as firm as stone, firm as the, as the nether millstone. We have Evan versus Kipelech Tachtit. Okay, we all understand that Evan, a stone, is less specific than the lower half of the millstone, right? We know that the Pelech and the Rimon, what's the second one? No, Pelech and, I should know, I forget. When you go to Mamlech uh, Tachina or Mamlech Tachalva, that's where you see it in the show. That's where, it's, where you go on a, on a, on a Tanakhtil to know what to Okay, but better probably to go to go to the show. So Evan and Perach Tachtit, obviously Perach Tachtit is more specific than Evan. Another example is this one we all know, uh, except we know the positive phrase in Yirmiyahu. Um, right, we know the positive that we say in all of our positive contexts, but it's also in Nivuat Pornut and Sefer, Sefer Yirmiyahu. Arei Yehuda, and then Chutzot Yerushalayim. Arei Yehuda is more, is, here it's geographical, it's broader. The Chutzot Yerushalayim is the more specific street, okay? So that, we often see that, again, not everywhere, but often we'll see in, ver in verses where the first part is more general and the second gets more specific. Okay. Um, okay, perfect. So let's talk about poetry and prophecy for a minute. I just brought two psukim from the beginning of Sefer Yishayahu. I could have brought the whole thing, but it doesn't fit on the slide. Okay, and I just want us to see that here, things get a little bit different. Because if we talk about, po I can't move. If we talk about poetry um, in Shira Shirim and Sefer Tehillim, it doesn't really, it doesn't have, they told me it was gonna happen. Hold on one second, I'm prepared. I'm emotionally prepared. Um, if we talk about it in books like that, it's not particularly, it doesn't matter so much because we're all sort of in agreement that these were human divinely inspired books, 
Okay, that's that's not a that's not a um, controversial statement, I don't think. But when you talk about Yeshayahu and Yirmiyahu and Yechezkel, and you have all of these prophecies that are said in the name of God that are delivered in poetic form, we have to ask ourselves: Does God speak in poetry? I'm going to ask that question again. It almost sounds like it, these. I'm sort of taking things that are so foundational to how we always read Tanakh, and we don't think about them. So I want us to sort of like take the dust off of these things. Okay. So we read we read a nivua. And this gets to like the heart of what is prophecy. Is prophecy that God said that exact word? Is a prophet a copy machine, right? Or those, what are those, those carbon papers? What were those things they used to have, right? When some of us were little, I still had those when I was in high school. Um, is, is a prophet a divine copier? And then that means that God speaks in poetry. God could speak in poetry. He's not limited, right? He could speak in poetry all he wants. But is that, do we understand that that's what it is? Or is it that like the prophet gave the words that he received from God, the form of poetry? Does everyone understand the difference between those two, right? God spoke and he gave him an image. He gave him a, a, a sense. And then the prophet spoke and said those, he shared that idea in the form of poetry. So here's an example. I didn't highlight all the, um, the parallelism, but I separated the verses so that you'll know, you'll see them. It's one of like the best, you know, when we take a, we make a sheet and we take a stock image and it says stock image. So this is a stock item in Tanakh. It appears all over. Okay, I have raised all you children and you have sinned against me. Um, that is here we have two contrasting statements right i did this and they did that right here we have also a famous parallelism if anyone ever studied it was here and they learned commentaries on this pasuk um you have to bring the yodea down here because it's an ellipses okay so here we have the shor and the chamor, the konehu, the ba'alaf. Yisrael lo yada, ami lo hitbonen. Yisrael, ami lo lo yada hitbonen. Here we have semantic parallelism where the words are in the same meaning, in the same order. Okay? Now, what does this matter, Yosefa? So I'm asking the question, does God speak in poetry? Is that is God speaking in parallelism? These are, these are sort of very... Um, we would say that there's sort of more human ways of writing. Since poetry is our best human model of intricately rich communication, not only solemn, weighty, and forceful, but also densely woven with complex internal connections, meanings, and implications. It may, he also liked the three in this one. It makes sense that divine speech should be presented, represented as poetry. And here I'm already taking a, yeah, question. I'm just saying there is the, the divine model that so could be like Yishayahu is saying, which is Moshe. That's right. So that that is the like gives you know the, the brush to speak about that, and is he you know could be Moshe is it Hashem has you know and yeah. he's copying that style. Right. So the question is 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 the is the raw material for that prophecy given from God and then it's given form by the human? That's the question. Or did God share that with Moshe in in in, in, in poetic form? I would say the exact same question. It's the exact same question for all the prophets as you would ask for Ha'azinu. In general, Sefer Dream is a little bit more of a messy proposition when you talk about authorship, because really, you know, you have many of the Rishonim will say, sure, Moshe wrote most of Sefer Dream. It's not really, it's not really a Hashem. It was Moshe speaking everyone in different versions about how much it came from Hashem and how much it came from Moshe. Um, I'm already here taking uh, an opinion by bringing Alter and then by bringing um, Avram Yoshua Heschel, who says something I think that's relatively similar in his perspective on prophecy. Don't at all have the same basic assumptions about the divine nature of, of Torah. But here he says that we represent, that the Nevi'im represent prophecy in poetry, because as we said before, poetry, it lifts the soul, right? Meaning, if I want to convey to you the most unique and divine message, I want to give it to you in a form that will 
impact your soul. Now for us, it's like Chinese, right? For most of us, it's literally Chinese, but for certainly the initial listeners and for when we can eventually, we understand that poetry is like touching a totally different part of ourselves. And so, so Robert Aldrich says, so when the prophet speaks and he shares the idea from God, he shares the idea in prophetic form. Uh, I'm sorry, in poetic form. And I brought just a small quote from Heschel. If anyone hasn't read it, I recommend reading the prophets. Um, the, the pro he really says the whole, I'm turning the lights back on, that the whole carbon copy thing, like a very infantile perspective on prophecy. Whenever I teach prophetic works, I'll open with this also in the second semester. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a not, it's an unrealistic way of looking at prophets. Prophets didn't get every single word from God. They got a general idea. And part of their work was to be, they were like commentators, essentially, of God's word. And so sometimes they could mess up. A Nevi Sheker sometimes was a charlatan, but often he was a really good guy or woman who just misinterpreted what they actually received. The prophet's task is to convey a divine view. Yet as a person, he has a point of view. He speaks from the perspective of God as perceived from the perspective of his own situation. And so I would say, right, take this idea and say those who spoke, not all, I mean, most of them, Bemet, are in, are in parallelistic and sometimes prophetic, um, poetic forms. Yeshayahu is much more poetic than Yirmiyahu, okay? Yirmiyahu, the book itself, it also has tons of narratives, but even in its, even in its more poetic, you know, Koamar Hashem and Rachel Mevakal Baneha, those poems, right, we sing them because we also understand them more, okay? We can understand them more because they're a bit easier. So, there are different, you know, we see, it's very clear to us that different prophets have different styles. And so when we, this question about prophecy and poetry, if I could just summarize it for a minute, is that, is that God isn't limited. He could have spoken in poetry, but I think I definitely go with this perspective more, which is that the prophet himself chose to convey the message in poetic form. It was a form that was more elevated, that moved people, and that, that reflected perhaps the deeper nature of the content of what they were giving over. Okay, we're gonna summarize because we're coming to a close here. Um, some of the main ideas we've seen, and I'll go back and we'll talk about the syntactic parallelism and semantic parallelism and ellipses, and those phrases will come up again as we go along, again, in a lot less technical detail. Um, there are different approaches, how to define poetry, although everyone agrees that Tanakh includes some poetry. Um, parallelism is a hallmark of biblical writing. Um, and not only poetic writing, but it takes on more intensity in poetic texts. Okay, as we saw, we have it in in uh, in the Heda. It's everywhere. We open the Tanakh. Any page you read, you'll see parallelism. It's everywhere. Um, Chazal recognized parallelism only for the meaning it offers, and not really for its poetics. It doesn't interest them. But again, I do want to say that historically, that utterly changed. That utterly changed by the time you get to the Rishonim who are influenced by Arabic poetry, Arabic meter, uh, and who looked at the biblical text in a much more literary way. And so you'll see that coming up in even Ezra. It also exists in Provence with Radak and other Prashanim, even Kasvi. It comes up in many of the Prashanim later. So I'm not gonna call it a non-traditional view. It makes its way into traditional, what we call rabbinic commentaries, but it's because they also were influenced by other disciplines as well. Um, we differentiate, we differentiate different kinds of parallelism and different trends like specific to more, uh, more general to specific, geographically broad to geographically narrow. Um, and as I said, that we will use a combination of all these ideas when we look at um, when we look at different texts. I will say though that I am very much a person who combines disciplines, but I will be looking at the meaning. Today was again the more technical, but we will be going much more at Shira Shirim. We're gonna be asking all these questions. Why Shira Shirim? The, the, the metaphor, the actual verses themselves, uh, and we'll be getting towards all of that meaning. I like to end all classes, starting since last year when I always had PowerPoints, and we'll see if it continues this year. I think it will, because it's just easier. Um, thoughts to end with, okay? What is your favorite poetic text in Tanakh, and what draws you towards it? Mine is Shira Shirim, that's why I'm teaching it. Um, where do you stand on the spectrum between omni significance? And the Vratara of Lashon B'nai Adam of Rabbi Ishmael, right? Where does that, where do you think about that? How do you, I, I, this year, I, this past year, I was teaching uh, teachers uh, all around the world through a program through Herzog. And 
this idea came up all the time because I was constantly on the side of Rabbi Ishmael, and 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 in every in everything they wrote, the perspective of Avni significance was very much there. They were very traditionally oriented, um, in many ways, meaning their and also the students they were teaching were often not in were not religious, or some of them weren't even fully Jewish. It was a very interesting experience. But um, but there's a question, right? Some of us may go to Matan and take a class that sounds like this, but when we say it's our Torah in our house, we're being Doresh every word in the Pasuk. So it's an interesting thing to think about and also think about how we feel about it, right? Do we feel, are we comfortable with this idea of, you know, Kefa Lashon or Dibla Tolab Lashon Bnei Adam? So those are some thoughts to, to think about. And as always, if anyone ever wants to write me their thoughts, I'm always happy to read them and, and I do respond. So a simcha. It says you can't see it, but yosefa.fogel at gmail.com. I'll write that on the side. Um, maybe I'll just also excuse myself since I don't think I did that maybe in class. Um, I did, I did, right? I said I said where I am. I said where I am. Anyways, um, it's great to be back and uh, looking forward to, to learning together. Anyone have any questions? Well, let me stop the share. Uh, I just was gonna. I was just gonna uh, mention that none of the powerpoints were readable on Zoom. PowerPoint is what? Not readable on Zoom. I know, but that's why there was a share screen. There was a share screen so that so that everybody on Zoom can just look at the PowerPoint on 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 the screen on your screen because I, I know that you can't see the screen here if it wasn't if it didn't work well this time then we'll we'll fix it for next time but it was supposed to be i think it was i shared this the powerpoint on zoom so that you can look at it here because you definitely won't be able to see the screen through uh, I just open share screen and it doesn't come through no i i just closed the share screen oh sorry I closed, yeah i just closed it but it was there the whole it was there the whole class okay okay good to know good to know Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. I will also say, in a totally side note, that I'm also at the Alaha. So if anyone ever needs that, just also know that I'm always here. I just want to also say it was a great class. Pleasure. Thank you. Nice to see you.